Hello and welcome to Nelson All Over Cards. We just got a brand new rules reference update for Marvel Champions. Now, this is a document that goes into the nitty gritty details of this game we love and outlines specifically how game elements work and interactions happen. As the living card game progresses, new interactions change how the game works. So that is why we have these updates. Like for example, in 1.5, we didn't have player side schemes. Before this update, or like since the last update to this update, we added a new player type. So part of this update was adding player side schemes into the rules reference to describe what they are, how they work, the limits on those, all of that was in here. So that's a that's a example of what could be added. In addition to some of those things, some rules do get changed around to either better fit new cards or to clarify and make sure cards are working as they are intended. So in this video, we're gonna go over a lot of those changes. Now you may ask, is this every single change that happened? Am I covering every single one in this video? No, I am not. I am not gonna do that. These are the most impactful changes, or at least what I think are the most impactful changes. There were a ton of changes in this document to get down to grammatical changes, right? Writing periods to MODOK again. Yeah, nice. But I have read through the entire document and I will be talking about a good number of these changes. But if you want to see all of them for yourself, I have linked the new document down below in the video description and I'd recommend checking them out. They did make it nice for us and all the new changes are in red. So if you're scrolling through that document, the red are the changes from our 1.5. That being said, if you have questions as we are going through this, please ask them in the comments and I will do my best to answer. But let's dive into the most impactful changes. And then after that, I'm going to pull out a few changes that are not overarching or maybe they're not they're pretty specific but either i have found them to be sad or we've talked about them on the channel before and i wanted to dedicate some time in the video to talk about those specific ones first up let's talk about targets or and or valid targets we talked about this a ton in our last rules update video where the game was changed from an action needs to change the game state to needing a valid target. All in all, I think this is a really good change. It makes a lot more sense for players coming in. What does modifying the game state? I don't know, right? So now we need a valid target. Not only, we're not gonna rehash all of that here. I will link that video here up in the corner, but we did get some more clarifications around what specifically valid targets or targets are. Now they are explicitly stated that a target is a valid for an ability for dealing or healing damage, adding, removing threat, giving, removing status cards, exhausting and readying the target and defeating slash discarding the target. So there is an exception to this rule though. I love that they did this. If a character has zero attack scheme or thwart and zero in this case is different than a dash, think Hulk ally zero or Hulk Hero zero thwart, Hulk ally dash thwart, different here. So if you have a zero attack or zero thwart in Hulk's case, they can still perform a basic power using that valid or using that value against something that would not normally be a valid target. Basically, Hulk hero can thwart a scheme to either like remove a confuse or now you can like thwart a scheme modifying that value with like a making an entrance so that you can actually remove some threat. Valid targets were also updated to call out cards which have multiple effects and references that target. This probably makes no sense, so let's go through some examples. So Concussive Blow states that you confuse an enemy. Then if you paid for it with a specific resource, you get to deal three damage to that enemy. And that's the key word here, that enemy. Concussive Blow cannot target a confused enemy because they are already confused. So Mainly, you cannot use Concussive Blow to deal damage to an enemy that is already confused or that is stalwart because it is that enemy. You have to look at the target of the attack. The target of the attack is an enemy and the effect of that attack is to confuse the enemy. So if you cannot confuse the enemy, the enemy is not a valid target for the attack and therefore cannot resolve the following sentence, deal damage to that enemy. The main effect matters here is that tackle is another example of a card that we cannot play against a stunned or stalwart enemy. Or on the flip side, if you look at it where the damage is kind of rearranged, 
Steel Fist states to deal 5 damage to an enemy, stun that enemy, can only be a target of an enemy that can take damage. So we have it in both directions, it's not just the tackle and the concussive blow, but if we have say Arcade, which is one of our new minions, and a trap scheme in play, we cannot use Steel Fist to stun Arcade because Arcade cannot take damage when a trap side scheme is in play. So there's a lot of weird interactions. I will probably mess this up. For most cards, it's probably a pretty rough value if we're going to be doing that in the first place. If we're going to use a three cost concussive blow for three damage, we're in a tough spot. But it is important to know that we cannot do it. And yeah, so I will mess that up. Don't worry. <laughs> I will probably mess that up. Um, one caveat I would like to call out here, or not a caveat, but a difference is to look at a card like Dropkick. This is different because the damage, deal four damage, is not self-referencing the stunned enemy. Dropkick, deal four damage. If you paid for this with only physical resources, stun the enemy, draw a card. That is worded differently because it's not self-referencing deal. It's not saying stun the enemy, deal four damage to that enemy. It is saying deal four damage then if you paid for it, you can stun the enemy. So if you can drop kick stalwart enemies all if you want. It's an interesting change. I, I think I like it. It makes sense with the valid target rules and how, you know, kind of we're approaching Marvel Champions in that setting now. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, but I will mess it up. Another change clarification we got in 1.6 is the resolution of activation. I say clarification because I realized that I've actually been playing this wrong. Well, I guess I've been playing it right now that we have 1.6 for a long time, but basically an effect that initiates an enemy activation is only considered resolved after the activation is fully resolved. This matters for cards like toe to toe and taunt. You have to resolve the attack fully before we get the damage output of toe to toe or the three card draws from taunt. Honestly, this is how I've been playing it always. It makes the most sense to do it this way. So yeah, I'm I'm happy with the change. Um, yeah, this is also the part of the video where we're going to talk about the controversy of Widow's Bite versus Quick Strike. So as it stands, the Quick Strike does resolve before we can deal any damage and stun via Widow's Bite. The Quick Strike, the damage has to go off before we can hit or before we can trigger the force re or the, the response on Widow's Bite. This makes sense to me from a mechanical standpoint. I think thematically Black Widow is a little bit faster than any Quick Strike minion. And I do wish that the card was changed to like an interrupt to reflect that. But yes, the Quick Strike, the attack needs to fully initiate, fully resolve, and then you can do responses to it. So there you go. Makes sense. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's the one that's going to upset the most people here. Um, but we do have to live with Quick Strike hitting Natasha before we can stun the uh, the minion. To go along with the update to the activation, we did get a new timing chart for activation timing. And just as an aside, I love these charts. The rules reference is chalk full of them. And when there is a question on what happens when or the priority of something, there's probably a nice chart in this document to help you figure that out. So here's the activation timing chart. I put it up on the screen. It's on page nine of the reference guide. I'll leave it up for a little bit. But the thing I really like here is that it does codify the retaliate question where it states that retaliate only triggers if the attack character was not defeated. There was a whole like conversation that we had for like future stage villains that have retaliate would we take that damage no because when we do defeat the first stage of a villain they're considered defeated and so now retaliate will not trigger that was a conversation that we talked about on a live stream for a good while and i'm glad to see that we do have some clarification around that um yeah so this this chart's going away now. Speaking of awesome timing charts, we did get another one on page 14 that goes into super detail of timing of damage being applied. So as we leave this up, you can read through this. Um, one of the notable questions I remember having that this now helps us with is like magnetic bubble with magneto. So now if we know that we have magnetic bubble, um, that does protect tough status cards because when Magneto would be dealt damage is priority one and then tough cards are, are, are priority two. Um, so the magnetic bubble states when Magneto would be dealt damage as a force interrupt, 
that's going to trigger before any tough status cards. And these are the types of situations I like to use these types of charts for. Um, again, that's on page 14 if you wanna dig into it a little bit more, but I'm gonna take it off the screen now. And the last chart that we are going to talk about today is not really a timing chart, but more of a priority chart around referential abilities. Basically, there are cards in the game that reference another card or potentially itself. And as the game has expanded, we're getting more cards in the game with the same name. The classic example here is the Spider-Man Basic Ally. It states that when Spider-Man attacks or thwarts, you, can't, you get to ready a Web Warrior character. Well, now that we have like 600 Spider-Men in the game, what does that mean? So this chart is gonna help us figure out exactly what different cards are referencing when they say when Spider-Man does this, et cetera, et cetera. So first priority is a card references a card which it is printed on. That takes priority. That probably sounds like a pretty silly uh, statement an obvious statement, but it does solve our Spider-Man problem because Spider-Man is the card, the card is referencing Spider-Man, it's now codified that it's referencing itself. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think the bigger change is in these second couple. The first priority is the self-reference. The second are cards that belong to the same identity or encounter set. And then third is finally all other cards. Their example that they used in the article that they dropped is Lethal Intent from the Nebula Nemesis set. It does say attached to Gamora if you cannot attach to the villain. And since Gamora is in the Nebula Nemesis set, Lethal Intent will only ever attach to the Gamora minion in that set. It will never attach to the Gamora ally or even the hero because there is a reference card in the set in which lethal intent is contained within. Basically, that's gonna always have a higher priority than the hero or ally. It makes sense, like it really does, but I will be missing that plus one attack on my Gamora card. Um, I played like, uh, two-handed games, or actually I think the game was with Jason, uh, D20, where we uh, had Gamora and Nebula and we were using the uh, the Nemesis sets to really beef up the other hero to get those additional attacks. So yeah, it was fun, but it makes sense. Next up, we're going to be discussing an uh, excellent change to multi-ability cards. What do I mean by that? Cards like multi-talented or hit and run, um, which are both attack and thwart actions. Now clear both stun and confuse status cards if they are near hero, which is awesome. That's that's a super cool change. It makes a lot of sense that it does change. Um, it is still the case that one status card will cancel the entire effect of the card. So if you are thwarted and you, or if you are confused, if you are thwarted, if you are confused and you play hit and run, it cancels the entire effect of the card. But if you are confused and stunned and you play hit and run, you clear both statuses. Awesome. Cool. Now, I wanted to slip that in as a good change before we talk about a pretty brutal change next, and that's the new find rules. The not as bad part of the new find rules says that you basically no longer search the victory display when you need to find a card, unless you're specifically stated to do so. They have also clarified that if you know where a card is, you cannot search other locations unnecessarily. Uh, and that kind of makes sense, but I have used that trick to look at like what's left in the encounter deck, even though I know that the card that I'm looking for is in the discard pile. So I guess I'm just going to have to work on like some exercises to make my memory worse, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but the, that's not even the worst part. The most brutal change here is for minion reveals. So if you are instructed to find and reveal a minion and that minion is already in play, the player that is instructed to find that minion engages that minion and resolves any keywords and or triggered abilities. This can be so brutal. So this means that quick strike will trigger again. You'll have to find those nasty treachery side schemes on those win revealed cards. Basically you are, it's not entering play again. They did call that out, but you're playing it and you're doing all the win revealed stuff and everything bad. Oh, it can be so brutal. It's very, very tough. So now we have to get rid of those minions ASAP. I have played it where we've left minions out knowing that we may tutor them and we could kind of negate that treachery or that uh, side scheme. A lot of the side schemes will pull minions, but oh, it's going to, oh, that's going to, that's going to be game ending, especially in like some of these multiplayer games. Whew, it's going to get very dangerous if you're going to have these quick strike minions or something that's going to be activating multiple times. It can be pretty brutal.
The last major change that we're going to talk about before we dive into some of our less impactful changes are the for each updates. And what I mean by that is that there are cards that have a for each effect, like Falcon. Falcon says that when he enters play, look at the top four cards of the deck for each treachery, for each. That's what we're talking about. And basically what has been clarified here is that cards that have a for each effect all target a single target unless there's a choose instruction. Again, this is like legalese at this point. So let's give some examples because I think those are more beneficial than just kind of the the if this choose for H. Yeah. So Falcon, we talked about Falcon. After he enters play, we're going to look at the top three cards of the encounter deck for each treachery looked at this way. Remove one threat from a scheme because there's not a choose effect. And we'll talk about a choose effect here in a second. All of that threat has to come from the same scheme. You're going to choose a scheme and remove three cards or three threat potentially if you hit all three treacheries where cards like flurry of blades and this is the other side of it says deal two damage to an enemy for each side knife you control choose and that's the important part here choose an enemy and confuse it for each psychotonic you control choose an enemy and deal two damage for it because we are able to choose we can hit multiple different targets with this card because every single time every single instance is a different instance of damage and we get to choose per instance of damage so if we have three enemies on the table we can hit every single one of those enemies for two or we can hit one enemy for six that's how it is for each one of these options they are considered separate instances of damage and threat removal even if we are choosing the same target so this is important for cards like warrior skill modifying flurry of blades it would modify each instance of damage so if we had two katanas flurry would actually do three damage three damage and then three damage and you could split that up into multiple enemies or all on the same one so kind of interesting changes there I think it makes a lot of sense. And like, also it kind of makes my brain start going. It's like, where are they going with the design of this game? Where like some of these uh, clarifications, like, oh, what are we, what are we seeing? We saw a lot of that with the deal versus take last update where it's like, oh, now we're getting some really cool like deal versus take um, interactions in the game. So let's transition into some of the sad rulings or things that we've talked about before on stream or on the channel that are not as impactful, but I did want to call out. First up, Spider SPDR cannot have Warrior the Great Web attached. She does not have SPIDER. -E wow, I cannot spell. I'm a really bad speller. Because it's not exactly those letters, she cannot have Warrior the Great Web attached. I think we all knew this, but this is now codified. We cannot do it. We did get clarification around hero form only cards. Hero form only cards are cards like Dazed and Confused or Webbed Up that say hero form only on them. Uh, that means that we have always known that that means that you can only play those when you're in hero form. But also now it is stated that they can only be put into play when you're in hero form as well. Basically, superpower training cannot hit Webbed Up, Boundless Rage, Frozen Solid, all of those kind of cards um when you're an alter ego so if you're thwarting down superpower training probably this is a multiplayer issue uh but if you're thwarting down superpower training i'm pointing to it right here on the table <laughs> um and like spider-man is an alter ego you cannot grab webbed up and put it into play i can guarantee you that i will forget this rule in a future game it may not be this week it may not be this year but it will happen i guarantee it please yell at me when i do please 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 uh, next up, if you are swapping cards in play with a card out of play, if they both have the same name, then basically nothing changes. The new card keeps all the tokens, statuses, play state, if it's ready exhausted. This is basically, uh, we were cheesing where we used Deadpool's arm to the teeth to swap Sonic Rifles out for Sonic Rifles just to get infinite confuses and never run out of charges. Now it's saying that if you swap a Sonic Rifle with a Sonic Rifle, it's going to maintain the exhausted and the number of counters on it. That's fine. I get it. We're no longer allowed to do that. And with Deadpool, we can just swap Katanas out, which probably is better anyways, but it is kind of interesting. I think that one's more interesting than impactful. Uh, I, I don't necessarily see a time where we're swapping cards that frequently. Uh, let's do some rapid fire changes that I thought were cool. Frontline specialist changed from having, uh, 
the text, your hero gets plus four hit points to your identity gets plus four hit points, meaning that we don't die when we flip to alter ego with four or less health remaining. This is a cool one. If the target of an ally's basic power leaves play before the ally deals damage, they do not take consequential damage. This matters for like the aggression Psylocke or Iron Fist, where they can deal damage with their forced, or not their forced, their interruptibility, where they can ping that damage. Um, now you are losing a counter, but if you ping a damage, that enemy leaves play via that ping, then they are not considered to attack. They don't take consequential damage. Kind of cool. Um, I don't know if that's like strong or if it's worth doing because you're losing out on a stun or a confuse if you're doing that. But it is kind of interesting. You're saving the ally. Maybe you really need to get rid of that minion and you need to keep them around for a chump luck. It is an option. It is something that we can play around with um, and just something that I thought was more cool and I wanted to call out. Next one is around indirect damage. Basically, all of the indirect damage is assigned and then resolved simultaneously. Basically, you cannot time the damage to help. Um, and, and let's go with an example here. If you have like Warrior of the Great Web out, no, I'm sorry, uh, Web of Life and Destiny out. We were talking about Warrior late earlier. Web of Life and Destiny out, you cannot assign partial indirect damage to a Web Warrior ally, have it leave play, trigger Web of Life and Destiny, draw a card, and hopefully that card could help. You can't do that. You're going to assign, I'm going to say Sandman's going to attack me for three here, two on my identity, and three four on this ally, and then they all resolve at the same time. So you can't kind of help it out. Actually, I was trying to find another example of where this could matter. Um, I'm thinking like I, the Web of Life and Destiny made sense, but I'm curious like if there's a like, there's no like when defeated, I guess Gamora. Gamora from the basic Guardians could uh, have an impact. But yeah, there, there are some weird interactions with that. And let me know if there's anything that really messes up a strategy or if this wasn't a rule, now that it's called out as being a rule, are there any things that we could have messed with? Next one is actually something that I think I've always played. Basically, if um, an ally is defeated or removed during a activation where that ally is defending, then that attack is now considered undefended. Basically, if you flip a boost card that says discard an ally, deal a damage to all your allies, and that takes out the ally that that is currently defending, it's now going to be an undefended attack against your identity. I'm pretty sure I played this way before. This is how it works in like the Lord of the Rings, the card game. So maybe I just pulled it from there, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. That was a pretty dense video. Um, I talked a lot. I tried to explain a lot of the high impact changes. There are a lot of changes out there. Um, I don't think that this was as big of a rules update as it was last time. That being said, I'm so happy that we do have a de developer team that is passionate enough about the project to continuously put out updates to the rules reference guide. It does give me a lot of hope for the future of this game. If you have questions either about what I talked about, about Marvel Champions in general, or about other changes, please let them know in the comments. As well, are there any changes that you were particularly interested in? Let me know about those too, because there's a lot of changes and I assume that we will find some interesting interactions like we did last time with Superhuman Strength and She-Hulk attacking solid enemies, right? So there's going to be more things that come out as we kind of sink our teeth into this rules reference more and more as we get reps in under the new games. So thank you very much to Tony. This was a, Tony Fanchi did the rules reference, or at least they were the lead on the rules reference. I think he did a great job here. So thank you, Tony. This was awesome. Really like, especially those timing charts. Those are great. So thank you for hanging out. Thank you for watching. I hope I made some sort of sense around the rules reference, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.